Summer is over. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Weren't you tired of all that damn sunshine? <laughs> Everybody had a good summer? Yeah. Everybody's looking forward to biochemistry? Yes. I like to hear that. I see a lot of smiles when I say that. I think they're laughing at me. <laughs> now you're really laughing at me. So welcome to BB450. My name is Kevin Ahern, and I will be your instructor this term. And if you're unfortunate enough to take BB451, I'll be your instructor next term also. So I like that person. Who said yay? There you go. A, right there. <laughs> so um, I didn't teach this class last year. And I have other responsibilities on campus. And I will tell you that I love teaching this class. And um, so I volunteered to teach it this year in addition to what I was doing because I like to be back in the classroom. So for me, this is a, a lot of fun. <clears throat> it's a chance to get to know a lot of people. And believe me, I'm going to get to know a lot of people this term. This is the biggest BB450 class ever by quite a ways. Uh, there's almost 400 people in here. Well, probably not everyone came today, I'm guessing. <clears throat> but 400 people registered for the class. And the biggest I've ever had before was about 300. So it's a pretty good size. It is also the biggest 400 level class taught on the OSU campus by quite a ways. The only thing close to it is BB 451. So um, it means it's a demanding class for me. I know it's a demanding class for you. But it's a demanding class for me because um, I um, need to give a fair amount of time to you uh, to work with you and to help you to understand this subject. So it's very important um, that I do that. Very, very important that I do that. Um, so that's uh, number one. Uh, number two, I, um, you have seen set up a camera. I videotape my lectures. And I do that because I realize not everybody can be here every single day. But I don't do it so you go skipping out. OK? I think that there's benefit to coming to class. And I will strongly encourage you to come to class. Um, and my policy is always, if it looks like everybody decides to skip out, then we stop running the camera. So the camera's there to help you um, and get through things that you need to get through. All right? I will post on YouTube and on this page that you see right here. You'll see uh, later that uh, the YouTube video will get linked uh, when this video is done. It takes about 24 hours. I'm actually ish working with a couple of technical issues right now um, on my videos. I'm trying to provide them at a very high resolution. Uh, so that you can see everything. And that takes a little bit more time to do. But I'm optimistic that I'll be able to get them up within about 24 hours um, whenever, uh, as soon as I give them. Please don't bug me and say, hey, where's the video? Because you know, I can assure you I'm working on it. Uh, so I don't need 400 emails reminding me the video is not there. Um, that's kind of annoying. Okay? But anyway, I, I will work to get them up as quickly as I can. And my aim is to get them up in 24 hours if it's at all possible to do that. Okay? There are sometimes technical problems, so I can't guarantee every day you're going to have a video. Another reason to come to class. So if you decide to go you know, hiking the day that uh, my camera doesn't work, that might not be a good idea. OK. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I, uh, we have uh, 10 different recitations uh, for this class. And uh, those recitations, the first one met this morning. Uh, recitations, yes, they meet the first week. And yes, I do expect you to go to recitation. 5% of your grade in the class will come from recitation, and you are required to attend. So if you don't attend, you will not get recitation grade. So it's important uh, that you go to recitation and participate. We're doing a couple of new things in recitation this year, uh, some of which I think will be helpful both to me to understand what you're understanding, and hopefully to you to better understand some of the things that I'm showing you in the classroom. So um, I hope that goes both ways. I asked the TAs if they could to come to class today. I know that all of them couldn't make it. But can I ask the TAs uh, to stand up um, if you are here? TAs, they decided to hide way back in the back underneath the thing so the people on top can't see them. So that's very clever, guys. Uh, <laughs> we have, <laughs> uh, they're, they're standing back here, Lisa, Rachel, John, and Robbie. I can't remember Robbie's, Robbie's got a, I remember his last name. I can't remember his first name. His last name is Blizzard. I love his last name. Okay. <laughs> Robbie is there. Anybody else, the TAs that are here? So if you can see, see them here, uh, you'll see them in, in class um, at the very least. OK, thank you, guys. Um, all right, so uh, I do expect you to go to recitation. I also expect you're going to read the syllabus. All right? 
syllabus is required reading the course, and I almost always include at least one question on the first exam from the syllabus. Almost always, all right? So it will pay you to read and know what's in the syllabus. There are things that if you ask questions that are answered in the syllabus, you're going to lose points. So again, it pays you to read the syllabus. It's not very complicated. Read through it, and I think you'll see better what's going on. OK. So that's the sort of a general introduction into the class. Uh, one of the things I learned in this class many years ago uh, in teaching this class was that it is a class where people come to it with a fair amount of anxiety. Oh my God, I've got to take biochemistry. Oh my God, I've heard it's awful. Oh my God, I'll never be able to get through it. Okay? Well, I hope, A, you know what urban legends are. They can go both ways. All right? Um, and B, I hope you realize the real power of positive thinking and the power of negative thinking. Okay? The power of negative thinking is such that you can convince yourself it's going to be awful, something's going to be awful. You can convince yourself something's going to be hard, it'll be hard. If you keep telling yourself that and you keep buying into that, you are going to find it's not going to be pleasant, it's not going to be fun. On the other hand, the power of positive thinking says that you make out of some, you, you get out of something what you make out of it. All right? You can make this class be as beneficial, as fun, as whatever you need to do. My job is to help you to get there. I'm more than happy to help you to do that. I really love that interaction. I really love that getting up in front of you and talking about a subject that I find one of the re most rewarding things for me are the large number of students who will say later in the term, wow, I never realized biochemistry could be so interesting. Okay. It's very gratifying to hear, and that's what I want you to feel. I want you to feel like when I understand biochemistry, I understand how my body works. I understand why I start breathing heavily when I exercise. And I understand what breathing heavily means. I understand what diabetes is. I understand why smoking is so detrimental at the molecular level. Okay. Well, smoking is detrimental because it causes lung cancer. Everybody learns that. But at the molecular level, do you really know why smoking is nasty for you? Well, you're going to learn that in this class. Okay? So I want you to take these things away. I know many of you are in pre-health professions of various sorts. And so I put a lot of focus in this class on things that relate to human health because it's important for you to understand that. And by the way, for any pre-vets that are out there, human health relates to animal health as well. Okay? So it's important that um, we come to this, or you come to this, I come to this certainly, but that you come to this with an open mind and a fresh, positive attitude. Okay? I really don't want you to be afraid of the subject. I really don't want you to be afraid of me. It's important for you to come to the subject in that way. And I think if you do that, you will be uh, much better prepared for it. Okay? Let me just take a, a quick poll here. How many people have some anxiety taking this class. That's it. OK, pretty fair number. All right. How many of you have I convinced not to have anxiety? No, there's nobody that convinced <laughs> that. OK. Well, hopefully, as we get going further along, that will happen. All right. One of the things that you're seeing is I'm a pacer. I like to pace. If you really want to watch something funny, turn on the video at about double speed, and you'll see me doing the tennis thing. OK. <laughs> I go back and forth a lot. All right. Um, it's one of the ways that I think. If I have to stand and give a lecture, like a lot of people give a lecture, and they'll stand here and they'll lean on the thing and so forth, I can't think. Okay? If you see me doing this, then you know something has happened to me. I've gotten brain damaged or something, because I, <laughs> I'm not thinking if I'm standing there like that. So I've got to move around. It's very important to do it. I got a new laser pointer. I asked my office. I said, well, one of the complaints that students have is that my laser pointer is too small. So I said, give me a bigger laser pointer. So look what they got me. I can't even hardly see that from up here, all right? So I'm going to have to find another laser pointer, I think. One of the reasons I'm making high-resolution videos um, is so that um, you can see the laser pointer, OK, uh, when you're watching the videos. That's uh, important, number one. And um, I think that uh, the high-res videos also help you to um, uh, better um, 
you know, see things in general, to, to overall I'll watch that. One of the things that you'll see in the videos is when you go into YouTube, expand it to screen size, that's one thing, and second, expand the resolution. You've got two controls there. If you expand the resolution and you expand the screen size, you'll get the best possible picture out of YouTube. And you will get HD video out of that if you do both of those. You can't just do one, you've got to do both. Okay? And if you don't understand that, come see me and I'll show you how to do it on my computer. Okay. Um, any comments or questions? Anybody want to say anything to get the term started? Everybody's going, don't look at me, you know? <laughs> One of the things you learn in being an instructor is, you know, you can always tell students, students, they're always happy to look at you until you think, oh my God, he's going to ask me something. And they start, they get really interested in, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, you see that happen a lot. And it's funny. So, um, I'm not going to call on you. I'm not going to pick on you. I'm not going to embarrass you any more than necessary. And um, I really want to help you to learn biochemistry. Okay. That said, um, who had the best summer vacation? You did. Yeah. What'd you do? I just served all summer and lived on the beach. And <laughs> wow, man, that was tough. Where <laughs> Where did you surf and live on the beach at? Santa Cruz and Seaside, Oregon. That's terrible. <laughs> That's really terrible. I didn't do that. I got to go to Italy, though. That was cool. I didn't surf or hang out on the beach, though. You had your hand up, too, didn't you? What did you do? Well, you can top that. You get a prize if you top that, by the way. No, you don't. Excellent. You said started welding? Yeah. Did you learn how to weld? Yeah. I, I have a few welding jobs around my house. Could I get you to come over? <laughs> Some gutters, you know. Okay. Anybody else? The longer you talk, the more will delay biochemistry, you know? <laughs> I mean, we could go through halfway through the term if we, you guys had enough stories, right? I mean, it's a big enough class we could do that. Nobody wants to talk about how I spent my summer vacation? How was Italy? Italy was... <laughs> well, thank you for asking. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Italy was a lot of fun. Uh, it was my first trip to Italy, and I went to Florence, and I went to Rome, and I, ha I got... Actually, I can tell you one cool story. This, this kind of blew my mind, okay? So, um, I was in Florence, all right? And I'm checking my email and so forth, because I'm, I'm actually teaching an eCampus class while I'm there, right? Which is, by the way, teaching eCampus from abroad is really great, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so I'm teaching this, I'm checking my email and so forth. And I get this email one night, and it says, Dr. Ehern, are you in Florence right now? And so I figure it's one of my Facebook friends who's seen I'm in Florence, and they're making a conversation or something, you know? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. Why? And she said, well, I could have just sworn I saw you. <laughs> And I said, oh, who are you, <laughs> right? So I have a lot of Facebook friends. I have no idea who they are because I've got YouTube videos and a lot of students watch the YouTube videos. Well, it turned out that this person, I didn't know at all, um, had been watching my YouTube videos and she lives in Florence and I'm walking down the street and she sees me and she says, a true story, it blew my mind. I thought it was a scam or something. She's going to come rob me or something. She's <laughs> she says, could I meet you? And I, why not? So I, I, I said, met her at a gelato shop, and um, she was a, a medical student, and she was actually seeking some advice. And so I, my wife and I sat down with her, and we had a wonderful conversation with her for about 45 minutes, and advised her about what to do with her medical school, which was kind of cool. Uh, so I was really touched by that. It was kind of kind of neat. So the YouTube videos are out there. I was really, really happy. It kind of convinced me that a lot of people are watching those YouTube videos, which uh, makes me feel very good. All right. Nobody else wants to talk? You do want to talk. I rode a motorcycle out of an airplane over the Grand Canyon, and I started lying again. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's repeat. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? Or you probably don't need to hear it. <laughs> yes. I spent all summer taking physics. Well, David, I hope, I know David, by the way, I, I hope that your experience taking biochemistry is better than your, your uh, apparent uh, experience taking physics. God, I 
If it's not, sue me, okay? Uh, wow, okay. You know, I, I hope that nobody says at the end of my class, God, I took biochemistry. Man, that would make me feel really bad. All right, I don't want to do that. All right, I think we can't delay the inevitable any longer. We've got to dig in. That was 20 minutes out of the term. Okay? Well, let's dig in. So, first of all, I want you to copy the URL for this page. I'm not going to give you a handout. The URL being right there. Instruct, BB450, Fall 13, Schedule Classroom.html. If you go there, you're going to get everything that's on here. I haven't yet posted the TA's office hours, but there will be a link for them posted um, once I have all of those. I'm still waiting on a couple students to give me their, TA, their, their office hours. Okay? Um, you get to this page, and you get to this page, and everything that will be important on the course will be on this page. That will include the syllabus, which is right there. That will include the outline from which I will lecture. That will include the videos and highlights. At the end of each, each class, I write a set of highlights that were what I considered the high points of the things that I had to say. And the highlights are what I use to um, uh, write my exams. So highlights are probably a pretty good thing for you to look at. I get questions in the class like, well, you've got a, you've got a book. And by the way, you've got several books on here. I've got a Stryer 6th edition. I've got a Stryer 7th edition. And I've got a book that my wife and I wrote called Biochemistry Free and Easy. This is a free book. You can download it. If you haven't downloaded it, I encourage you to do so. I think you'll find it helpful. There's a version for the iPad if you have an iPad, which will have the most features. And if you don't have an iPad, there's a PDF that you can download for your personal computer as well. So I encourage you to get that book. Now, I've got all these materials out there. I've got highlights. I've got books. I've got problems, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? What's the most important thing I need to learn? Right? Well, there's a lot of material in this class. I'll be honest with you. All right? I will tell you that I can promise you I will not ask you exam questions about things I don't talk about. So when we're looking at priorities, the highest priority are the things I talk about in class. I'm not going to go find an obscure fact out of the textbook in an assigned reading assignment that I gave you that you're responsible for. Okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to ask you questions about things that I talk about. The books, therefore, are supplemental knowledge for you to help learn the material. Sometimes explaining it, reading it in the book can make more sense than listening to me. All right? So that's uh, what's there. The figures, all the figures in the course are present in Blackboard. And you can go to Blackboard and download those figures, and you will have um, everything I talk about. So I recommend actually downloading them before class, print them out, or electronically deal with them so that you can write on them and so forth as I'm lecturing. That way you're not trying to reproduce the figures, and it'll help you to stay on top of what I talk about. I do talk fast. Okay? You probably have already seen that. I talk fast. I don't do it so I can scram more, you know, scramble more stuff into the lectures, but I do tend to talk fast. So um, hopefully, if you have the figures in front of you, you can uh, stay up uh, reasonably uh, apace with what I'm having to say. OK, all the problems that you see over here are for your practice. You do not have to turn anything in. That is in the classroom class. The eCampus students, they have to turn problems in because they don't have recitations. Okay? The classroom students do not have to turn problems in. The eCampus students have to do that. Okay. Well, that said, let's uh, dive into um, our problems. We start with um, some very general things talking about biochemistry, and then we turn our attention to talking about water, aqueous solutions, acids, bases, and buffers. All right? Now, one of the things that I discover in teaching this class, and I will say this is not student problem as much as it is instructor problem, but I find that students haven't been properly taught in their general chemistry class about acids and bases. And the problem was that they have been sort of forced to crunch numbers without learning concepts. And so in this class, learning concepts is much more important than crunching numbers, as you will see. So I will emphasize to you in the problems and things that I'm doing a practical knowledge of what the numbers mean. Not that we can calculate something to six decimal places and therefore we have it all figured out. Okay? It's important that we 
be able to understand what the concepts mean. Well, biochemistry, all right? Biochemistry stretches from cells to Linus Pauling. How do you like that, okay? From cells to Linus Pauling. When we think about biochemistry, we think about the molecular basis of life, all right? I'd like to sort of start thinking big, okay? We think about ecosystems. Ecosystems are giant collections of organisms, environment, et cetera, that come together as a whole. We can think of the Earth as an ecosystem. We can think of the Pacific Northwest as an ecosystem. We can think of McDonald Forest as an ecosystem. Big, big things, okay? Within that ecosystem, we find individual organisms. Those individual organisms might be fungi, they might be plants, they might be animals, they might be bacteria, they might be human beings, okay? We've just gone from an ecosystem to biology. Biology is the study of organisms, whether they're plants, whether they're animals, whatever they happen to be, okay? Well, I mentioned bacteria. We know that multicellular organisms are multicellular, meaning that they are comprised of individual cells. And so when we move to the level from organism down to the level of, of individual cells, we're talking about microbiology. Microbiology includes cells of an organism. They may include bacteria. They may include viruses, okay? And that's the realm of microbiology. What we've done is we've gone from very big to smaller to smaller yet. In biochemistry, we take yet another jump smaller, okay? With biochemistry, we're talking about the molecular basis of life, how molecules enable life, how the reactions between molecules enable life. That's what biochemistry is all about. We're going to spend most of our attention focusing on proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and fats. And we'll work with the individual components of those as well. Most of the early part of the term, we're going to spend talking about proteins. Because proteins are what I describe as the workhorse of the cell. It's because of proteins that cells can catalyze reactions. It's because of proteins that cells have structural integrity. It's because of proteins that cells can talk to each other. And yes, cells do talk to each other. It's because of proteins that a cell in one part of a multicellular organism can send a message and have it received by a cell in another part of that multicellular organism. Okay. Proteins make all of these things possible and more. Okay. We're going to see, and as you see on the screen, some depictions of uh, some proteins. We're going to see that there's a very strong relationship between structure and function. The structure of a protein is purely the determinant of its function. If you destroy the structure of a protein, you alter the structure of a protein, you will almost always destroy the function of that protein. The reason you cook your food the reason you kill bacteria is because heat destroys the structure of the proteins in those cells and kills them. Okay? Structure and function are absolutely essential. One of the things we're going to see, you look at this and you think, well, this is kind of funny. We go from a cell to Linus Pauling. Okay? One of the things that we see is it doesn't matter what the cell is, whether it's a bacterial cell, okay, or it's a plant cell, or it's an animal cell, or whatever kind of cell it is, all right, the proteins that are in that cell are in most cases very much like the proteins that are in Linus Pauling. There's amazing similarity across all of biology. Very, very similar proteins. We discover that the genetic code that we use to make proteins for Linus Pauling is exactly the same genetic code that the bacterial cell is using to make its proteins. We're not as different as you think we are. There's a message that you take home this term. I hope that's one of them. Okay. That's 4.5 billion years. 
There's the tree of life, okay? The tree of life has evolved over a span of 4.5 billion years from a progenital uh, cell that has started down here that we don't know exactly what it was, all right? But it gave rise to everything that we know today. And this thing keeps, there we go. This thing uh, that gives rise to everything that we know today. Today we talk about three major groups of living cells. Three major groups. Bacteria, also known as prokaryotes. Okay. Higher organisms, also known as eukaryotes. And eukaryotes include humans, dogs, cats, plants. They even include a few unicellular organisms known as yeast. Okay. So some eukaryotic organisms are unicellular. On the other hand, all bacteria are unicellular. Most eukaryotic cells are multicellular. The last group over here is a relatively recently described set of organisms in the past 30 or so years. They're known as the Archaeans. And they're kind of bizarre. Uh, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. I will mention them uh, on one occasion. That may even actually be next term. I can't recall when. But the point is that they're relatively um, odd, and they won't fit into the scheme that we'll, we'll be talking about. They're not that different either. They use the same genetic code and so forth. So it's not like they're uh, from outer space. OK. All right. You guys had this in, in high school. I'm not going to tell you about the structure of DNA. We'll, talk, I, we'll actually talk about the structure of DNA next term. Um, the four bases of DNA, um, A, C, G, T, uh, we all know, of course, are critical. Um, and they're critical because those bases convey information. When we think of DNA, we think of RNA, we think of information. Proteins don't carry information. Proteins carry the instruction, or are, are the result of the instructions of DNA. Okay. There's a schematic diagram of the structure of DNA. No, I'm not going to ask you to draw that on the first exam. By the way, I don't ask you to memorize very many structures in this class. I think it's much more important for you to understand what molecules do than what the structure is. Where I expect you to memorize a structure, I will tell you. Okay? Yeah, you're responsible for this structure. All right? But I'm not going to tell you to memorize specific structures for the most part in the class. I show you this structure because it shows the backbone of DNA. DNA has a covalent backbone. That is a set of molecules that are joined by covalent bonds. And I show this to you to remind you about the nature of a covalent bond. A covalent bond is a bond in which there's reasonable sharing of electrons between the nuclei. There's a reasonable sharing of electrons between the nuclei in a covalent bond. This differs from an ionic bond in which there's essentially no sharing. One takes the other one's electrons away. Okay? Covalent bonds are very, very strong. Very, very strong, as we shall see. Everything you see on the screen here is a covalent bond. The structure of a single strand of DNA is very strong. But notice I said of a single strand. DNA is a double strand. If I were to peel these strands apart, one strand and hold it over here, and the other strand and hold it over here, all the bonds in each one of these guys would be really tight and tough. They'd be hard to break. However, the bonds that hold the strands together are not strong. And that's important and that's good. They're a bond we're going to talk a lot about this term, <coughs> excuse me, known as a hydrogen bond. You learned about hydrogen bond in basic chemistry. We're going to talk a fair amount about hydrogen bonds. And I think you're going to see the importance of having hydrogen bonds. Having weak bonds like a hydrogen bond enables so many things to happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. So the bonds between the bases that you see between here and here, okay, these bonds, oops, these bonds between here and here are hydrogen bonds. Okay? That's important. 
this shows the hydrogen bonds. Here is here are the bonds between uh, an adenine and a thymine. You can see adenine and thymine have two hydrogen bonds, one here, one here. What is a hydrogen bond? A hydrogen bond is a bond that involves a hydrogen, needless to say, that involves an attraction, but not a covalent bond. Okay? It's an attraction, but not a covalent bond. This hydrogen right here is slightly positive. This nitrogen over here is slightly negative. A slight positive is attracted to a slight negative. There's a force that pulls them together, and that force is a hydrogen bond. Here's a bond between this hydrogen, which is, which is slightly positive. Here's the oxygen, which is slightly negative, and they too are attracted to each other. It's not an ionic bond. It's not a covalent bond. It's somewhere in between. Okay? That's a relatively weak bond, and as we will see, that's important. Okay. Here's a variety of hydrogen bonds. We use this delta sign that you can see right here as a way of indicating a partial charge. Partial positive, partial negative. Partial positive, partial negative. The hydrogen in a hydrogen bond will always be partially positive. Partial positive, partial negative. There's a variety of different hydrogen bonds that can happen. Okay? No, I'm not going to ask you to memorize all these. That doesn't, that memorizing that doesn't tell me anything. Okay? But knowing what a hydrogen bond is, is important. Okay. Here are some examples of biological or structures within biological molecules that might have hydrogen bonds. Here's a carbonyl group. You're going to see carbonyl groups coming out the wazoo in a protein. Okay? Here is a water molecule. Hydrogen is partially positive. That oxygen is partially negative. They are attracted to each other. Surprise, surprise, proteins tend to be soluble in water. Not always, but they tend to be soluble in water because they form hydrogen bonds readily with water. Things that form hydrogen bonds with water will tend to be soluble in water. Things that tend not to form hydrogen bonds with water will tend not to be soluble in water. Okay. Uh, let's see. Van der Waals. I mentioned this one very briefly, okay? Um, and it's not something I'll make a major point of, other than later in the term I will bring something up about them, okay? Van der Waals forces are forces uh, between um, atoms. And what this graph tells us is something, basically, is that Van der Waals forces can exist in two ways. They can be an attractive force at a certain distance between the two atoms. And if we try to get them too close to each other, as we see right here, if we try to get them too close, the repulsion takes over. And the repulsion takes over very, very quickly. The bottom line you want to take home from this figure is the fact that the more we try to scrunch together atoms, the stronger the repulsive forces will be. That means that there's going to be restrictions on how closely together we can squeeze atoms. That will become a consideration when we start think thinking about structures of proteins. We can't squeeze things together too close. It's kind of like going to the party and you're th somebody you've just met there hasn't bathed in about four days. You know what I'm talking about. They will have a circle around them. It will not be close to them. Okay? This is like a van der Waals force. Okay? There's something that's going to drive you away from that person, and there's something that's going to drive atoms away from each other. Okay. Let's see. Protein folding. We're going to see proteins are amazing things, and they do amazing things. And I said structure was important to function. Proteins are polymers of amino acids. We think of polymers that make plastics. We think of polymers that make carbohydrates. We think polymers that make DNA. And polymers of amino acids make proteins. Those polymers, those long chains of amino acids, are not regularly shaped because there are 20 different amino acids that appear in proteins. Each amino acid has its own characteristic. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And so we don't get a regular repeating structure for most proteins. That means that they can fold up. And the folding of a protein that actually does fold is something that is critical for its function. You can see a protein here that has folded up. You can see a protein here that is folded up. And we'll talk later about what these structures actually mean. But you can see that it starts out as a nice linear chain. And when it folds, it folds into something that looks like what we call a glob. And it's called a glob. We call these globular proteins. That's what we we're actually looking at. Okay? But this glob is not a random glob like it might be if you took a bunch of toothpaste and you threw it on the floor. Okay? This glob is very precise in the structure that it will have. Very precise in the structure that it will have. In fact, the same protein, if you allow it to fold under the same conditions, will always give the same structure. Okay? or almost always. We'll see a one or two exceptions to that. But basically, we get the same structure if we have the same amino acid sequence. That's important because structure is important for function. If structure is critical, we want to have the same structure every time. And that's what we get with a protein. OK. Let's talk about thermodynamics. Oh boy, huh? Thermodynamics. We're going to spend not much time here at the beginning, but later in the term we're going to talk about thermodynamics because thermodynamics relate to energy. And one of the things that cells have to always, we rarely use the word always, but this is one place where we use always. One of the things that cells always have to do is keep energy in mind. Cells are dependent upon energy. We'll see later exactly why that's the case. Right now, I will tell you it's the case because cells are fighting entropy. What's entropy? Disorder. disorder. That's what everybody says. It's disorder. It's this tendency to be chaotic. It's this tendency to be mixed up instead of being orderly. If we compare a cell to the universe, a cell is very orderly compared to the universe. In order for that cell to maintain order, it must expend energy. No, cells do not violate any laws of thermodynamics. Cells exist completely within the laws of thermodynamics. Okay. How's that for a thermodynamics lesson? All right. Well, let's turn our attention to the meat of what we're going to be talking about for the next day or two. And that is, aqueous solu that is an aqueous solution. Okay. Aqueous solutions, of course, are those of water. Right? And water is essential for life as we know it. We are comprised of 60 to 70% water by weight. Okay? We are walking balls of water. We're walking balls of bacteria too. Did you know you have 10 times as many bacterial cells in your body as you have human cells? kind of a scary thought, isn't it? What if they decide to revolt? After that, that cheesecake that you had that you didn't refrigerate very long, it might revolt. Okay. We have to think about water. We have to understand water. And here's where freshman chemistry is going to get a push for you. Okay. In freshman chemistry, you learn that pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay. And for most of you, that was probably something you memorized and forgot. And it might have been something that you memorized and had to do on a calculator, and you forgot, and that was that. Okay. What is pH? pH is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. From a practical point of view, what does it mean? From a practical point of view, it means that the lower the pH, the higher the hydrogen ion concentration. The higher the pH, the lower the hydrogen ion concentration. Well, you know that. Something that's got a low pH is acidic. And something that's acidic has a lot of protons. And a proton is a hydrogen ion. OK? That makes sense. What's the pOH? Well, the pOH is the negative log, is the negative log of the hydro hydroxide ion concentration. What's the P. Kevin Ahern? 
It's the negative log of the Kevin Ahern concentration, of which there's exactly one in this room. The Kevin Ahern concentration is low, but you might think it's too high. I don't know. <laughs> okay? We put the P in front of it. We have made the negative log of something, right? POH is exactly the opposite of, of pH. A low pH means a high POH because pH plus POH equals 14. So if the pH is 3, the POH will be 11. You can do the math. All right. If the pH is 7, the POH is 7 also. Right? All right. Now, at this point, people will sort of break off and they'll say, OK, well, now we need to talk about acids and, and, and um, uh, dissociation. Because how do we get protons? We get protons by the dissociation of a proton from an acid. All right? well, I'm going to use the term acid and base and so forth a little different than you're used to doing. And I do it to actually clarify things. Because there are things that you probably don't realize are acids that are actually acids. Anything that can give a proton is an acid. Anything that can give a proton is an acid. You're tending to think, well, if I have something and it's in a solution and the pH is 10, I must have a base. But in fact, you may very well have an acid in that pH 10 solution. So we're going to change the definition. And it's actually the, the correct definition. This is something you didn't get out of freshman chemistry. The correct definition is an acid is something that has a proton it can donate. An acid is something that has a proton that it can donate. We're not going to use the term base in this class, except for one thing. We're going to use the term base only when we refer to strong bases. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. Why do we call it a strong base? Well, because if we take sodium hydroxide and we put it into water, every single one of them comes apart. If I put 5 million sodium hydroxides into a water solution, I will get 5 million sodiums, and I will get 5 million hydroxides. Okay. When we talk about sodium hydroxide, we're going to call it a strong base. We're not going to call anything else a base. Am I clear on that? We're not going to worry about what a conjugate acid is. We're not going to worry about what a conjugate base is. I'm simplifying your life. I promise. Okay. We're going to introduce another term called salt. Okay. A salt is something you probably in the past have thought of as a base. A salt is an acid that has lost its proton. So I've got an acid, that's something that has a proton to give. And I've got a salt, that's something that has lost the proton. All right. For example, if we look up here, we see acetic acid written as HAC. There's the acetate, there's the proton. Acetic acid is a proton attached to an acetate. Notice it's an acid. Acetic acid has a proton it can give up. It gives up that proton when it dissociates. When you put it in water, some of those protons come off. Notice I said some. Not all of those protons come off. Okay, But for the ones that do come off, we see acetate is a salt. It's something that's left over when the proton lost, I'm sorry, when the, when the acid lost its proton. Acid is HAC, salt is AC minus. Notice, I did not say the proton was an acid. I said the proton is a proton. Okay? Acid has the proton to give, salt has lost the proton. Very, very important concept. Now, the last thing I'm going to remind you about before you leave today, this is the time for everybody to start shuffling and getting ready to go. You're a good class. I like this. Okay. All right. The last thing I'll remind you about is I said that this acetic acid does not completely dissociate. Are there acids that completely dissociate? The answer is yes. They're the ones you studied mostly in freshman chemistry. 
Remember HCl, hydrochloric acid? We call it a strong acid because just like sodium hydroxide, when we put it in water, it completely comes apart. If I start with 100 million HCLs and I put it into water, I will get 100 million protons and I will get 100 million chlorides. Completely comes apart. If I take and I put acetic acid into water, and I take a start with 100 million acetic acids, I may get a few thousand protons coming off, and a few thousand hydroxides made, but most of everything is going to remain as acetic acid. That's the difference between what we call a strong acid and a weak acid. A strong acid completely dissociates. A weak acid does not completely dissociate in water. There's a good take-home message. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.